right, y'all, welcome back to This Is That with Pastor Steve Berger. I'm so glad you're with us here today. We've got a great word for you. In fact, this is gonna be part one of a two-part message that I'm doing for you called Look Up, Not Back. Look Up, Not Back. Now, we want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel, Pastor Steve Berger. Make sure you get the notifications and share it with other people. Help us get the word out uh, so that people can be encouraged by the word that we're bringing. Okay, so here we go. Let's start with part one of two, look up, not back. Now, beloved, without question, There's this issue in the end times, the scripture talks about it um, twice at least, that there is going to be a departure from the faith. First Timothy chapter four, verse one, the apostle Paul writes and says, but know this, that the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, people are going to depart from the faith because they're gonna give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, but there's going to be a departure from the faith. In reference to Jesus' return, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse three, there's something very interesting that that Paul says. He says, that's not gonna happen until there is this falling away, this apostasia, or in our English language, the apostasy. So, in, in just two different epistles, the Apostle Paul lets people know, man, the last days, it's going to be a hectic, chaotic, spiritual time. There are going to be people who depart from the faith, who fall away from the faith, and they're gonna go back to a godless, Christless lifestyle. And it's heartbreaking without question, and yet we see it throughout scripture but not just scripture, we see it in our own day and time. Like we're living through this right now. I'm telling you as a pastor of 31 years and and being in the middle of the whole COVID thing, I don't know that you know this, but I'm telling you that there are pastors who have lost their faith as a result of what happened with COVID. There are people who no longer go to church who lost their faith because of COVID. They just couldn't get their head or their heart around the fact that God would allow such a thing to happen. And if he did, he's not worthy of my service or of my faith. And it's been a deal, man. It's been a huge deal. Now, when we look back in scripture, we see this same thing. And I could give you multiple examples, which I won't, but um, the Israelites in the wilderness, think about this. They get delivered from Egyptian slavery They're wandering uh, around out in the wilderness. And what do they start doing in the challenges of the wilderness? What do they start doing? They start wanting to return to Egypt. And they start romanticizing about the past. Oh, the garlic and the leeks were so good, you know. But here's what they forget. They forgot the fact that they were in slavery, okay? Listen, friends, a Christless past is nothing but a mirage. It is a make-believe oasis that vanishes when you compare it to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. For sure. Make sure in the midst of maybe your own wilderness challenges, your own trials or tribulations, that you don't start romanticizing about the past, that you don't start looking back with a very, very unrealistic view of your past, your Christless existence, and start being drawn back to it. No, no, no. In those times when you're going through challenges, you need to look up and not back. When we get into the New Testament, Jewish Christians, A mere 30 years, think about this, this isn't a long time. Jewish Christians, a mere 30 years after Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension, were already falling away from Christ. Why? Because of trial and tribulation, because of tough times and persecution and peer pressure, they started looking back. What was the solution for them? It's the same as the solution for us right now. You've got to look up, not look back. You've got to keep your eyes. Listen to me. This isn't just bumper sticker stuff here. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus, 
on his majesty, on his ministry, in other words, who he is and what he's done, what he's accomplished for us, that is the entire point of the book of Hebrews because the Hebrew Christians were looking back, not up. They started falling away from the faith and the author of the book of Hebrews writes to them and says, listen, you've got to start getting your eyes back on Jesus. You have to stop your romanticizing of the past and you have to start looking up about your future encounter and life with Jesus Christ, okay? So the book of Hebrews, that's the whole thing. It's about the supremacy, the superiority of Jesus Christ, all right? Now, right out of the blocks, I I love this. The author, right out of the chute, in the first three verses of the book of Hebrews, gives us eight different facts about Jesus that would have been a shock, it would have been a jolt uh, back to reality for these Hebrew Christians who were, again, looking back instead of looking up. So here's what I wanna do after that little um, uh, introduction there. What I wanna do is just share with you over the next two weeks these eight facts about Jesus that I hope will help you to look up and not look back. I don't know what you're going through, but I uh, uh, I, I think that uh, many of you are probably going through a tough time. There's something about your life right now where you're wanting to look back and you're romanticizing about the past and you're thinking the past wasn't all that bad without Christ and or maybe you're frustrated or offended with God right now because of things that he's allowed to happen to you personally or maybe in the country nationally. Listen, this is time for you to get a refocus on Jesus, to look up and not look back. All right, so let's do this. Let's read the three very first verses out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three. Listen to this. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, but he in these last days has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Right there, friends, right out of the blocks, eight different things in three short verse verses to show us how incredible Jesus is, to get our focus back on, again, his majesty and his ministry, who he is and what he's accomplished. So here we go. He starts off by saying to these Hebrew Christians, I know that in the past that God has spoken to us by the prophets, but not anymore. God has in these last days spoken to us by his very own son. We know that what the prophet said was important, but what the son of God himself said is even that much more important. You remember when Jesus was sitting around the campfire with the disciples at at Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asked the question in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. He said, hey, who do men say that I am? And they started giving different answers, uh, comparing Jesus to some of the different prophets. But then Jesus asked the question to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? Didn't matter what the world says. Who do you say that I am? And then Peter gave that great answer and he said, you're the Christ, the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus affirmed it and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. Peter's declaration as to the sonship of Jesus so far surpassed what the ancient Hebrew prophets Um, uh, would have have held in, in esteem and opinion. He said, you're the son of God. You're the very son of God. And Jesus said, Peter, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So right away, when when Paul writes this to the Hebrew believers, it's getting their perspective right. 
We're not just dealing with a prophet, a teacher, a good guy, as the world has made Jesus out to be today. No, we're talking about the very Son of God. Now, number two, let's move on. He's, Jesus isn't just the Son of God. As the Son of God, the scripture tells us here that he's the heir of all things. Jesus himself said in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, all things have been delivered to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father, nor does anyone know the father except the son and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him, okay? So everything's been delivered to the son by the father. Matthew 28, 18, what did Jesus also say? Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So the father has relinquished to the son everything. He's the heir, not just of some things, but of all things as the son. This makes total sense. Jesus as the heir with all authority, listen, will one day judge the living and the dead. Jesus also said, all judgment has been given to me. All things have been delivered to Jesus for him to judge people's eternal habitation. Listen, leaving Christ and going back to a Christless life, you don't ever want to do that. This is a sober, serious word. The Hebrew Christians are thinking, yeah, I'll go back. I'll partake in religion and I'll still believe in the prophets. No, no, no. This isn't about just going back to the prophets. This is about departing from your faith in the Son of God. And don't ever do it. Don't ever do it. Don't let trial, tribulation, COVID, peer pressure, anything else, take your eyes off of who Jesus is. He's the son and he's the heir of all things. And one day he's going to judge the living and the dead. It's all about Jesus. Look up and stop looking back. Number three, Jesus also is through whom God made the worlds. It's like Paul is going from one incredible declaration about Jesus to the next. You realize, you realize that Jesus is creator of the world. John chapter one, verse three said what? All things were made through Jesus and without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians chapter one, verse 16, for by Jesus, All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, whether they're visible or invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, power, all things were created through him and for him and by him. Hebrews 3, 4, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So Jesus is the son of God. He's the heir of all things. Excuse me, he's God the son and he's creator God. Do you see what this is doing? This is challenging the Hebrew Christians. This is challenging us to have a proper perspective, again, on the majesty and the ministry of Jesus. Look up to him. Look into his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Don't let the devil, don't let circumstances, don't let trials, tribulations, or peer pressure keep you from understanding the majesty, the mystery, and the ministry of Jesus. Next, number four. Jesus is the brightness, it says, of God's glory. Now, I don't wanna get all technical on you, but I do wanna just throw this out to you. Two different kinds of light. There's refulgence light, which that which is a reflected light. And then there's effulgence light, which is original light. Now, Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. He is both original source and reflected brightness of God's glory. He is the day spring on high. He is the very source of all light and life. And so when we're thinking about Jesus and considering that he is the brightness of God's glory, he is the very source, the origin of light, and he is the reflection 
of God's life and light. Listen, Jesus is no dime store prophet. He's no mere moral teacher like the world has tried to make him to be. No, no, no. He is God himself. He's the brightness of God's very glory. I, I love what John says, John 1, 1 and 1, 14. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, the one who came from the Father, who is full of grace and truth. This is who Jesus is, the very brightness of God's glory. So friends, there you go. There's, there's part one, the first four parts of the awesomeness, the incredibleness the eternal glory of who Jesus is. Listen, if you're thinking about looking back or you're being tempted to look back to what you would consider an easier, Christ-less, God-less life, don't do it, follower of Jesus. Don't even play games with thinking thoughts like that. Don't let it be said of you that you are one of those who fulfilled what Paul warned about in 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2, where you departed from the faith and fell away from the faith. God forbid, we're not of those who draw back. We're of those who press on and press forward and we keep our eyes on Jesus no matter what comes our way. And so beloved, look up, don't look back. This is the end of part one and I can't wait to give you part two next week. Make sure you tune in. God bless you mightily with the grace and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you next time.